prevent nations from going to war. And for that reason, the members of the United Nations furnish the forces and they act in concert to prevent a world war, and that's a police force. The Second World War is over. Former allies are now enemies. An emerging Cold War turns hot on the Korean Peninsula after American and Soviet forces partition Korea. On June 25, 1950, more than 75,000 Soviet-backed communist troops of the North Korean People's Army cross the 38th parallel bordering the two countries and attack South Korea. They are in Seoul in less than a week. In an early test of the newly formed United Nations, member countries resolve to respond. Five years after history's bloodiest conflict, no one wants another war. Leaders insist the intervention in Korea will be brief. There is no formal declaration of war, yet nearly a million military personnel from 16 countries deploy to the peninsula over three years in one of the most destructive conflicts of modern times. With the Soviet Union supplying material to the north, the fighting marks the first head-to-head -head confrontation between communism and U.S.-led forces of the free world. Canada joins what is by any other definition a war. It forms a special force as part of the U.N. effort in Korea. Canadians fight iconic battles on land, sea, and in the air. 516 die. And when the killing is over, the more than 26,000 survivors spend years fighting for recognition. It is called a police action and becomes known as the Forgotten War. But for those Canadians who fought in Korea between 1950 and 1953, neither time nor circumstance can erase the memories of what they saw, smelled, and experienced in the hills and valleys around the 38th parallel and beyond. In late 1950, U.S. troops break out of Pusan and push north driving the invaders back across the border, crossing into North Korea. Chinese forces respond for the first time, crossing the Yalu River and pushing UN troops back into the south. Seoul changes hands four times before the two sides settle into positions along the demarcation line. In early spring 1951, 8,500 Canadian troops are at war. They see their first action in mountainous terrain. As Chinese troops launch their 1951 spring offensive in the Kapyong Valley leading to Seoul, 1,500 coalition troops are at the tip of the defensive spear. The 3rd Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment, and 2nd Battalion, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, bear the brunt of the assault and stop 10 to 20,000 Chinese soldiers. It is one of the war's greatest and most pivotal battles. Meanwhile, at sea, eight Canadian destroyers serve in waters off the Korean Peninsula during the war. They conduct blockades and escorts, 
evacuate trapped civilians and coalition troops, and bombard port facilities and shell trains winding their way along the coast. UN ships destroy 28 trains. HMCS Crusader leads the way with four. Canadian troops take up new positions along the Jamestown Line between Hills 227 and 355. The latter, the sector's dominant peak, is known as Little Gibraltar. They face superior numbers of heavily armed and motivated Chinese troops who attack in waves behind heavy artillery strikes, often culminating in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Canadians hold the line. Official Dom dubs it the Korean Conflict. Three million people die. Negotiations to end the fighting take two years. There is no formal peace. It is history's longest negotiated armistice. A tense ceasefire. The war technically still exists. South Korea rebuilds and becomes an economic jewel of East Asia. An international pariah, North Korea languishes under cult-like leadership. fathers and brothers have fought twice already during this century in two great world wars. 